this is William Allgood. We're here from the General Andrew Pickens chapter, Sons of the American Revolution, of the South Carolina Society, of the National Society, Sons of the American Revolution. We're making it a purpose or objective of our group to meet each World War II veteran in our area of South Carolina. And we want to recognize them and tell them how much we appreciated their service. Today, we're going to talk with Colonel Benjamin Scarden. And so, Colonel, I would like for you to tell us about your military service, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. I graduated from Clemson in class of 38. However, I was only 20 years old, so I didn't get my commission. Unfortunately, that same summer of 38, I contracted typhus fever, and that I lost so much weight, I couldn't take the physical to get my reserve commission until December. So come the next, uh, in June, excuse me, on July the 5th, I came on active duty at Fort Scriven, Georgia with the 8th Infantry Regiment. At that time, every, we were at peace. Uh, the, the war was raging, uh, naturally, in Europe, and Mr. Hitler was uh, leading everybody uh, on a big chase. Uh, uh, that affected Mr. Roosevelt, and he was uh, the key to everything because before that, Mr. Hoover had not been very active at getting things done. Uh, that is one of the, uh, I'm not political, but I'm, I'm not a Democrat. <laughs> now, my brother is a yellow dog Democrat. <laughs> and if you know what that is, you can do this. <laughs> if you don't know what it is, I'll tell you what it means. Tell us. It means this. If you would ask my brother, the eldest, the one that was a German prisoner, uh, about, uh, well, see, and down in the lower part of the state, my home was, Walterboro, South Carolina, tourist town all the way down on I-95. Well, uh, if you would ask him about his, uh, excuse me, we had no Republicans in Walterboro. We also had very few Roman Catholics. And I'm setting you up for <laughs> the way I was brought up under those influences. But back to the yellow dog, the thing was, my brother would say, he'd quote people, I'd rather vote for a yellow dog than be a Republican. <laughs> so I'm sorry it took so long. <laughs> That's great. I'm sorry it took so long <laughs> to get that out. Uh, di I digress. That's one of my great sins. And I don't mind you saying, now we were talking about so and so. <laughs> because I do need a reminder, because one thing leads to another. My service in, in the 8th Infantry, <clears throat> uh, that was a, just a battalion post outside of Savannah, Georgia. We enjoyed uh, second lieutenants there were, uh, uh, by the way, nobody has ever heard them called shave tails, but we were over, you, you've heard that. I've heard that term. Thank you very much, so you get one coupon. <laughs> so, uh, but at that time, mobilization was taking place. Now remember, the army, the armed forces were all white. There was no integration. There was a black infantry regiment, the 24th regiment, but at Fort Benning, they were primarily took care of the horses because we were horse drawn then. Cavalry was for, uh, horses, artillery pieces drawn by horses. And I took equitation down there as a second lieutenant in every Saturday morning. Uh, I always think I was the only one who, after six weeks, was not allowed outside the paddock, to my disgrace. Now, back to the 8th Infantry Regiment. Uh, that's, I've always, my heart has always been there. And so we went on maneuvers down in uh, Louisiana. The Louisiana maneuvers were uh, every year at that time. And so in October of 1941, I received orders for 
I mean, I received orders earlier, but uh, for the Philippine Islands, remember, we are not at war. Uh, everything is very comfortable, but the tanks were beginning to roll out and this, and uh, General Patton was making his name. He was a brigadier general at Fort, uh, Fort Benning, and then there was a major general over him, the overall commander. Now, there was a clash there. In fact, everybody clashed with General Patton. <laughs> so, uh, just a little color. When uh, the, that major general down there was called to Washington for conferences, uh, Patton, with General Patton became the post commander. He eliminated all MP uh, stops, uh, traffic control, raised the speed, speed limit, and uh, he himself uh, went around the post there. I'm talking about the training areas out, 20 and 30 miles out. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was, I always tell about my first experience with Dr. with General Patton. I was a, a platoon company company commander, now first lieutenant, and we were walking along each side of the road, and here come these sirens and three tanks. But in front of the three tanks were about four uh, motorcycle men with Tommy guns. So they come up and they screech right in the middle, and he says, pops up, who's, who's in, you had a high voice, who's in command here? I am, sir. Well, get your troops off the road here. Yes, sir. And But when those um, motorcycle guys came up, they slid the motorcycles down like that and came with guns pointed at us. <laughs> I tell you, I didn't know what to... <laughs> then I know, hey, that's General Patton. I'll leave that alone now. Although my brother was the, uh, the uh, honor guard for his body when it was carried across by train, uh, the low countries. Uh, my brother Steve, uh, who finished in 39, brother Jim in 42, my brother Hooper was back in 34. Mm -hmm. My brother Alvin, the German prisoner, uh, he was a scholar of the family, College of Charleston, later <laughs> on PhD, University of Chicago. I went to, left the States and uh, along with a bunch of other officers, uh, 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 a commercial uh, ship uh, still had the, the civilian uh, crew and waiters and everything. And of course, the uh, officers had the top two decks and uh, the enlisted personnel, which was a regiment of the, co uh, of the newly, newly organized anti-aircraft regiment. I don't know they'd ever fired around. <laughs> However, they were from New Mexico, and uh, and that's where I walk every March in commemoration. But uh, that ship, we left the 3rd of October of 41. The 23rd of October arrived in the Philippines. Five weeks later, we were at war. Now, between that, in the, during that five weeks, when I got there, uh, I received uh, a, about a four or five days of orientation of what to expect and so forth. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that the army over there was just being mobilized. So I was sent down to Samar, the island of Samar, and I found another first lieutenant, an American sergeant, and we had a battalion of recruits. I just want you to know it. Nobody sits in that chair. <laughs> That's uh, Trevor Lawrence's chair. <laughs> Who you see that? the picture? The quarterback. Oh, back here? Oh, okay. The quarterback. So you're the guy that I read in the newspaper for the, for the, um, that goes every year and goes marching in honor of those in the... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So... 
<clears throat> While I was on the island of Samar, we got orders to bring our battalion to the big island of Luzon. So uh, we loaded up and uh, we were a day out of Manila when the captain of the ship uh, called to the Remember, a white man over there, and I have to put it that way, but white people were like God to others. Now, I mean that more seriously because you could write, uh, if you took a ride in a calesa, which was the taxi cab, uh, all you'd have to put the name of BN's God and my number and the U.S. Army on a piece of paper and give it to him, and that would end up in your PX bill in the next month. I mean, that's how things were. However, we were out in Manila Bay when, uh, on December the 7th, and uh, the uh, captain called Lieutenant Coburn. He was barely senior to me. But in that day and time, if it was even five hours, he was still senior. Mm -hmm. Also, he was about 6'3". <laughs> so he and I went up to the cabin and he was highly excited. He said, the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, it didn't sink in. And uh, he, he said, what, what, what do I do? Coburn says, that was a lieutenant. He said, uh, call Port, uh, Port Authority and have request immediate that, you be, uh, that we be landed. And he says, I've already done that. They told me to stay away from the port. And he grabbed the microphone. He says, this is George H. Coburn. I'm in command of 600 troops. We're sitting out here in a ship in the harbor, and I want landing instructions now, or let me speak to General MacArthur. <laughs> now, that's a hero for you. Risk his whole neck and everything else. So, there was a moment of silence, and it started crackling again. Uh, Uh, bring your ship in to Pier 3 right now, or right away. So we cool, get in there online, get on buses and go up to Cabana to one where our training camp was. And of course, uh, the only people, Manila had not been bombed. There was some bomb at Clark, uh, at Clark Field a little later on, and another field down on over towards Cavite. Now, if you need a map reference, this is done very often. We keep one right off to your left there. Mm -hmm. yep. But you, because we get to put to a, to a town, it's just a peninsula down off, sticking off the end of the Luzon. Mm -hmm. Okay, we get up there, we get to, uh, from there, our regiment, and at that, up until that time, we were uh, military, uh, advisors to the Philippine Army. So we had no command function. So we had uh, the, uh, well, one of the problems was, one of the major problems as far as I was concerned, we later on I was put in command of Company A of the 1st Battalion of the 92nd Infantry Regiment. But until that time, I advised the Filipino officers who were from Luzon, and they spoke Tagalog and English. The troops we had came from uh, Cebu and Leyte. There's a mountain ridge there. On, so some of the troops on that side spoke Cebuana, on this side spoke Wari Wari, H-U-A-R-I, dash, H-U-A-R-I. It's in the dictionary. <laughs> uh, <coughs> So how do we get instructions from us to the, to, uh, the Tagalog speaking officers to the non-coms? And that's the key right there. Mm -hmm. If we got the non-coms to know what, we were teaching out of field manuals. And so, uh, but we sent that problem, Morse code, down to uh, Davao where our or Mindanao, the southernmost big island. Mm -hmm. And uh, our headquarters, American headquarters, down there. 
So we, they, they ask, what are your problems? How can we help? So Coburn and I went into the local telegraph man and sent a telex down there, tell them about this problem. What? Here's our problem with communications. Mm -hmm. And no son of, oh, excuse me, oh, I, I have a bad habit of putting other words in there that I don't mean to say. <laughs> so those guys, what, what do they wire back? Try Esperanto. <laughs> At that time, some Englishmen were trying to make an international language, and it was called Esperanto. And they had gotten a lot of no, no, no sponsorship. No, nobody was excited about it except yes, it would be good to have an international language. Well, when they sent that back, uh, from then on, I said, "Let's don't go to that headquarters anymore. Let's just do our work." <laughs> <coughs> now, of course, there was no answer, but we managed to stumble, stumble along, and the soldiers seemed to get the... But, you see, they hadn't even fired those rifles. What rifles? Well, it was a British 1898 Enfield, uh, 30 caliber, bolt-operated, just like we had, but the Springfield was about a pound. We didn't have Springfields. Uh, the British Army, I mean, the Philippine Army was issued those uh, Enfields. Mm -hmm. That's significant because that's what they fired, shot with. But fortunately, the our uh, ammunition was compatible with uh, that bolt. Our the workings of the Enfield. But with a bayonet <coughs> attached at that time, everything always had your bayonet attached. I mean, they, I didn't have a rifle. Uh, I had 45, and, uh, but I go out back and forth. When we had military ceremonies down on Samar, they liked ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Two things, their helmet was a, uh, a, looked like a fireman's hat, went back and sloped down, and it was made out of the fronds of the mm -hmm. palm trees woven, and then orange, no, this is true, mm -hmm. orange shellac. So when they walked down the, the sun, I mean, you could pick them up wherever they were. <laughs> which, but they wouldn't put mud on it. We were, told them to put mud on it so you, uh, they, because the, the nips were small, the Jeffs were very smart with getting a rifleman, one of their chip, snipers up there with a long range, and picking these guys up as they go through a rice field. Now, I've observed that from places of security. Right. Well, back to the, uh, uh, that is significant, by the way, <coughs> in lessons learned and what, how can you prepare for those type problems in our situation? That, now, I'm not saying uh, that we do, that we have to find a way. Yes, we have to find a way, and we did. Uh, later on, I just melded with my troops. I had a couple of lieutenants that could speak good English. Uh, they advised me, and I would make any decisions. We, we were pretty much, I was a company commander, but a regimental commander, the guys he kept on his staff were all married, had a wife and children and so <laughs> forth. <laughs> so. It's automatic if you've had some training at OPLR as the outpost line of resistance. I spent all my time out there. <laughs> In other words, we made first contact when it was coming down. Mm -hmm. I'm not bragging, I'm just stating you how what the status is. <clears throat> well, I grew with that company, but of course, as the more we got back to Baton, uh, my strength had gotten down quite a bit and uh, but the, the defense there was where we spent most of the time just dug in we had wire and the soldiers had 
had got, saved cans and things. He put pebbles in the cans and then attached the can to the wire. And at night, that was when everything, they, those guys would get on their bellies. Mm -hmm. But the soldiers made a split bamboo, made a point on it, I mean a sharp needle point, and then hardened that in the fire. And then on the wire, had them down. So if you put your hand out, you'd get a two or three inch thing right in your hand. Well, of course, there were monkeys. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> you'd hear a slush scription, something, and all of a sudden everybody, their side and other, we'd all open up. Now, I never heard, I never heard the monkey come down. <laughs> but what I'm saying, now this is just normal things. It's the monkeys at night. Hey, you're sitting in the in the woods there. Mm -hmm. Now, no radios, no contact. The only contact I had with my CP from with the regiment. We didn't have even have a battalion. Well, we had one, but it didn't function. Mm -hmm. You go right to the regimental commander. Was to send a messenger, and the, they had the mess. That's the where they make the food back to the regiment. And twice a day, we'd send a patrol back from my company, and they had these poles, and they would hang these buckets of rice and uh, some kind of gravy or soup or whatever, come back up, and then they, they would dole it out to the soldiers and go down to the, where they were down here on the wire, and, put, and then the food would be put their food be put out there. Mm -hmm. It's a wonder we even last as long as we did. But I got evacuated from that situation to the hospital, and then the surrender came, and I was war ambulatory, and then we started on the march. Now, remember, uh, people don't realize, but the march took uh, several weeks or more to, because these people over here on the west coast, China Sea was there, that's where we were. They had to go all the way across Bataan and join, and here's the march route right here. And I figured from uh, Maravillas Point to up here to this uh, first uh, step, uh, prison camp was about 80 miles. Now they don't, other estimates are less than that, but they're not as far down as, excuse me, this is a little private point I'd like to make. <laughs> that why we have estimates from 60 to my estimate uh, of eight. Now, I remember walking. Fortunately, I had a can of condensed milk. And so, uh, Along the way, uh, sometimes you got some rice, and uh, but generally no. And the water was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you this road, they had this uh, rice field water over here, but they use human waste there, you know, for uh, fertilizer and so forth. And the doctor would pass out where don't drink the water under any circumstances. But of course, there's some that just, you know, and later on, they'd be missing. I mean, it's hard to describe the march because I was a short man and I was at the back end mm -hmm. of my group. Mm -hmm. Now, these groups were like uh, four or five hours in between, over over days, the go my friends uh, who joined me later in this prison camp, first prison camp, were Henry Light and Otis Morgan. Uh, both one was a classmate and one was a year ahead. Uh, but they we met up that first prison camp, and from then on for the next two and a half years, we lived like brothers, and uh, also. I would not be here if it had not been for then and my Clemson ring.
because well, Otis, one of he was. This is now the work details in the Cabana to one work camp. Otis could speak enough of Japanese so that he could pass on to the work detail what the Japanese guard told him we were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Because they were, uh, there's so many things coming up. Well, I'd like to tell a story about the okra patch. Uh, I would like to get on the detail that did the okra patch. Now, what I'm talking about is 50 of us on the guards and say, let's say, orders, and orders say, hey, do he wants us to go out and pull up every blade of grass in the okra patch. Well, how you do that? Well, you get on your hands and knees and you have a furrow, and you? The okra's up here, and it's about that long. Mm -hmm. As you go along, depending on how daring you are, and see, you can tell where the guard is because they walk in adjacent furrows. I mean, so when his leggings goes by, and you check the other side, and you pick out this piece of okra about that big, mm -hmm. and you get up there, you reach up and you flung nails and put it in there, and don't chew. You. You're stealing from the emperor to cut your damn head off if you... <laughs> now, excuse me, that was the threat, but they did remove some heads. They didn't do it out there on the farm. Mm -hmm. On the farm was the work detail, right. and that's what I'm talking about. But in my talk when I'm <laughs> right. telling you about that, I love okra. So you get it in there, and you let it, you don't chew it and swallow it. You let it, let the saliva break it down. Every little seed, even if you can get into the cavity, you can still get it out. And, but when he gets on by, and the minute you can switch that thing around, oh man, let that stuff go down your throat. Usually, I make that okra sound so good that anybody <laughs> has a garden, the next day is a b b bag of okra on my floor. No, it was that good. Yeah. It was and that's what I remember. Alive. And that's what <laughs> later on, yeah. the ring it was, it was a thing that saved my life. You did what you had to do to stay alive. Well, yeah, but sometimes you had to be creative. Right. For example, Coming in from the farm, we always felt a great relief when you get inside the gate. Because on the outside, those guys had whole handles and things like that, and this took a delight in cracking a few. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, also, uh, when you got inside, you could almost do like that, that fear that. Uh, not quite a word. This apprehension you have about don't do anything, don't look a Jap guard in the eye. Right. I mean, you have to learn all that and to stay alive type thing. In other words, I take pride in saying I'm a survivor. That's all. Yeah. So that that was the working on the farm. I left there, left Cabana to one big work camp. Thousands there, mm -hmm. thousands died there also. See, we had, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> you all have somebody else to go, don't you? We do, but we're enjoying your talk, so keep going. Well, I'm wound up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I left there in October of 44, that work camp. Got in the back of a truck with 500 others and went down to Manila and they put us in an old bill of bed prison. Well, there's already a bunch of POWs in there. Mm -hmm. And all you do is find out where the chow line is and go, because that, you got rice twice a day. <laughs> and one thing about the sewerage problem. Oh, yeah. They had a gadget 
It was on an incline. And you could uh, walk up that incline, and in the here was a uh, kind of an old pipe. And you'd stand over that and crap into the pipe, and the water would come down. And, but you see, <laughs> this is gross, but she's close, a relative friend. <laughs> <laughs> You can imagine sitting there, and then that fellow right up ahead of you, the same position. Right. That's not nice. And sometimes it's not very strategic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, enough about that. So, then they put us on December the 13th. Mm -hmm. They put 1,600 of us from there. We all went down to the, the pier sat on the pier, uh, everybody that had a, who had canteens and all they had, but by that afternoon, we got there in the morning, that afternoon we still, our segment was still here, and you could see them loading that forward hole, the rear hole, and then the forward hole. Mm -hmm. And so, I know when I went up on top, uh, and got on, looked down in there, I could see all the heads of the people down there, and uh, but there was a let's see, you could go down a couple of steps for the first deck, and then the next one you climbed down. And as I looked down, I saw that, that the guard was down there, and for some reason they like to be bare from here up, and uh, that's my picture of him, right. muscular, and he had a, a a big old like a snow shovel or something, and he was had. People would get off the ladder there, he'd wham them, and if he had to wham them twice, and just pushed them back, pushed them back, he didn't care where the hell you went. Mm -hmm. So when I looked in, I said, hey, watch, when he swings and hits that fella, start running right away, go by him. And I did, and he didn't, hit, he didn't catch me. <laughs> so I dove right into these, these bays. It's people sitting like this in rows and the uh, same thing over here, there's no provision for anything. You didn't go to the bathroom, or if you did, you went right where you were. That was put nicely, wasn't it? Yeah. You wash your hands. I poke fun at myself sometimes, because I get so wound up, and all of a sudden, what I'm telling you is, pictures come across my head, and that's what I'm describing. So, that was like, <clears throat> when I rode home from there later on after the surrender, and we were, they sent out a letter prior to back to our family, mm -hmm. I said, I will tell you about my boat trip, but to give you some idea, it was worse than the black hole of Calcutta. <laughs> now, I, I don't remember that. I just remember my father telling us about the British soldiers oh, I put down in a hole. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was bad. But you can live without food. You can live without water. Mm -hmm. But you can't live without air. And you start cutting off your air, you'll fight. Right. To do anything. Now that's the chaos that was going on. Fortunately, I was on the lower level, sitting like this. I know I would because I was the last one in. They just pulled pull me, but these guys pulled me in. Mm -hmm. I didn't know one of them, and so I was against the bulkhead. Well, somewhere in there, I fainted or whatever, because I can remember the guy saying. Hey, this guy's out of it or something like that. And I remember them pulling me down, putting my head out. And when I opened my eyes, I could see the sky up there. Right. Now, there were feet all around and clamor. Mm -hmm. And the worst of all, panic. They tried to lower, well, they either hear the Japanese, tried to lower a bucket of some kind of soup or something or another. A gravy or whatever. And of course, those guys, they jumped up there and put their hands in it. Of course, the damn thing 
when all I went over. Of course, they were licking each other's back, getting this, you know, the. I reckon that's what they were doing. I mean, I'm I'm on the floor watching, and but all of that business, of, and I'm breathing like that. Well, then uh, the night it got uh, ever got got calm. This temperature went down oh, yeah. great, and that helped. The next day, here come these little blue dots in the sky. A damn carrier, 125, not knots, <laughs> not fathoms, <laughs> 125 miles off the coast. Mm -hmm. The uh, Navy pilots came around and then they started diving. Now we were on the Orioko Maru. If you want detailed stories on that, just go to Google, put Orioko Maru, and you'll get several eyewitnesses, mm -hmm. and most of those are good. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, survive that. Uh, see, when the, when the bomb fine, see, when they would bomb, I mean, we could, uh, uh, you could hear a lot of whistling type things. Mm -hmm. And I thought, being a book, that we would be down below the water line. Well, I hate to tell you, but this was real. I figured if they blow a hole in, the water's going to come in, and like I said with an automobile that's existing, so let the water come in, and there'll be two inches or three inches where you can breathe. Mm -hmm. And then, I, then when it does that, you can scoot out that hole. Now that, um, um, you might think that's incredible. No, that's, that's believable because that's what I plan to do. Well, when, when the thing finally hit, of course, all the dust and, the, and when the bomb goes off right nearby, it burns out all the oxygen. You can't, get your, can't catch your breath. And talk about going wild, wow. That's the most horror I have ever experienced in my life. So everything got quiet because there were bodies everywhere. Uh, I'm up here underneath here. The bomb hit, opened up the, the stern of the ship. And after a while, I don't know why, I just, I just stayed there. And all of a sudden it seemed like everybody was gone. And it was, uh, some fella got out and said, uh, if you're going to get off this ship, you better get off its own fire. Well, I better look at it and have a look around. Everything is deathly quiet now. And I could see that beautiful, what's in, that gin I drink? Bombay. Sapphire. Bombay. What? Bombay. Bombay. No, no, the, the color. Bombay Sapphire. Sapphire. Very important. <laughs> That's what I drink too, so I'm right with you. <laughs> well, we can stop here for a minute. I'll have a drink called a Martini. M A R. <laughs> Marti. T I. Martini. E Y E. And President over here asked me for a recipe. I said, We don't have a recipe. <laughs> well, how do you make it? I say, We have our ritual. Put him well, a special apron. Who rescued you from the ship with the hole in it? Nobody. <laughs> I'm coming to that part. <laughs> I'm going to jump off. So almost everybody was cleared off of where we were down here. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't even know about the other hole up, up uh, on the other end of the ship. Mm -hmm. And I walked out there and looked down and about seven, eight feet down, this, uh, sapphire colored mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. Off in the distance, I could see palm trees. Mm -hmm. But the whole place out there had all these black heads bobbing up and down. I did not see any Japanese shooting at people in the water. Mm -hmm. I do know they shot machine gun right above because I, well, later on, I joined some guys who were in a lifeboat. Mm -hmm. 
And what we were doing, they were eating the emergency rations. And the picture I remember is a guy sitting up on the side of the thing, had one of these big King Kong, King Kong, uh, like a parsnip, a long radish. Mm -hmm. He it was mustard. I mean, and he was eating that, had his trousers down, and was crapping off the side of the boat. <laughs> I thought that was, excuse me. Well, at that time, I didn't laugh or anything. I just thought, what a man would do to get something to eat. <laughs> right. Oh. I'll leave it, leave it alone. <laughs> well, then eventually, after they put a couple of bursts over, oh, everybody, there were three or four other guys, and they paddled toward shore, and then we jumped out and went up there, and there was machine guns up there. And uh, you could see this wet path where uh, others had all gone up. Mm -hmm. So I just followed that on up to what they call the tennis courts. It was the Navy Officers Club at uh, Subic Bay. Mm -hmm. That's the ship one. We go on, get it on another ship, go to get as far as Formosa. At Formosa, the I don't know how many, maybe, uh, of the 1,600, but there, maybe they were a 1,000. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But we had plenty of room, and it, it was in a boat that had transported horses. And that's, in my speech that I give, that's, that's the second ship. Mm -hmm. Well, damn if they don't bomb that one. And this actually, is the thing that kind of tells me something. I, my friend uh, John Shaw, NC State, he and I were there sitting down. It was open up here on the stern. The bow was up there. Uh, now, you can't see any of that. That's what we're always down in the ship. But we hear this roar coming. Oh, so. Before we could do anything, the one bomb burst somewhere just above this thing because all these timbers started coming down. And a lot of those bombs must be so, the air, everything is full of splinters and fragments. I suppose people just give the general name shrapnel. It's not shrapnel, it's bomb fragments. I mean, what I'm talking about. Because of the five, but the five guys out here, plus John, were all killed. Mm -hmm. They didn't even nothing else, no quiver, no, no nothing, just clean, bam. Mm -hmm. Well, I grabbed. Of course, I didn't know that. I grabbed him and holding on to him, because this bomb it went off somewhere out there. Boiling water comes down, and. Uh, now, excuse me, I don't mean a big splash, I mean a spray type thing. Right. For moments, I didn't know, and it's the first time I think I, for the first time, I probably lost it uh, for a while because I know that some guy was trying to pull a shawl away. And I said, no, he's, he's my friend, something like that. And he said, he's dead. You gotta turn him loose. Well, then things start getting in perspective. The raid was over, but what had happened, the second bomb went in the hole, and that's when they had damn near 80% uh, of those dead. Mm -hmm. Now, my friend Henry Lightner su survived that one, and Manny Lawton, who wrote the book, Some Survived, is a good Clemson boy. Right. So, we survived that ship, got aboard a third ship, and that one was a little dirty. <laughs> Where those horses had been, we had plenty of room down this big old, and of course, the bodies were just put into a net, pulled up, and then put them, taken on later on, we understood there was a, a burn the body there. Mm -hmm. uh, a 
on that, that ship before it was hit. We had plenty of time. See, we, we spent a week or two <laughs> down in the bottom of that ship, and we got, a, I think it was like eight uh, mess kit spoons of water mm -hmm. a day. Mm -hmm. And we had all, always ahead of where you could count everybody's, you watched it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and everybody would get that and they would sip it a little bit. And because you, you, you could just do it like that and it's all going. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to put this with some nuances where personal things get in there. Right. Your thoughts and so yeah. forth. But the droppings from the horse, they had oats. And it was all dried. Of course, the horses weren't in there. And when you you notice that they were a little, uh, a little seed-like on the end of the oats, that these were, now they weren't plentiful. You had to stir around in the dried manure, mm -hmm. and you could, and pull that, pull back that little husk, and it was a little sweet thing. <laughs> you could see people, <laughs> Trying you know, to working on those things. I'm so gonna, I'm going to ask you to move forward towards the end of the war. That's the long. That's another three hours. Because <laughs> we have to be leaving shortly. Okay. Now the third ship got to J Moja, Japan. I stayed there. Uh, maybe uh, five or six months until President Roosevelt died, and that's where we, they told us your president has died. Mm -hmm. Then he moved us up to uh, over to Korea. From Korea, I ended up in Mukden, Manchuria, and that's where the uh, surrender came. It was the best camp I was ever in. And would you believe it was the worst that other been in? Uh, well, anyway, uh, from then on, everything was joyous, but unbelievable. So, uh, we got a rumor, we lived on rumors, but there was one that was impossible. They said American bomber had dropped a bomb and destroyed a whole city. That's too much, eh? <laughs> so the ordnance people tried to design a bomb. It was over 100 yards long. The Air Force, excuse me, Air Corps people tried to rig up a bomber and they, were, they couldn't build a they didn't, there was no way it could take off and land because it took like four or five miles to get up. Right. I mean, that, this is all crude drawings and things. So, over the door. Of course, a week later, damn, you think another city. And then on top of that came the surrender. Nagasaki and But Hiroshima. there's no word for surrender. Now, camp commander, the Jap commander, he wouldn't surrender. Mm -hmm. A parachute team came, dropped in. Free Americans carried the forty fives. Oh man, he even had a movie thing, and I saw a movie called Stage Door Canteen, <laughs> and I thought the morality of the nation had gone to hell. <laughs> and it <coughs> has. <right? laughs> Furthermore, the opponent saith not. That's words from the court martial. I'm the opponent. Got home October. 23rd. Got to go. When I first came back, I was humiliated. Mm -hmm. I mean, we surrendered. And to come back in October of 45, and uh, I had four brothers, they all served in Europe and India. Mm -hmm. But we all got back, although my oldest brother was a German prisoner, mm -hmm. the Battle of Bulge. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now, on behalf of the National Society, Sons of the American Revolution, yes, sir. we want to thank you for your devotion to our country and your service in World War II. It's been an honor to be able to hear all of your ex 
your talks about all of your experiences during the war. Well, and thank you um, so much. I hope I didn't lay it on too thin. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I'm sure these gentlemen want to shake your hand. Yes, well, sir. It's been thank an you, honor sir. and a privilege to do Yes, sir. It has. Thank and, you. and thank you very much for your yeah. well, uh, And such a young yes. fellow. Yeah. Thank, you. Right. thank you for your service. You did a good we job. We really enjoyed your tales. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'd like to hear some more. Yeah. <laughs>